So imagine you have someone in Connecticut who has fun videos. Those fun videos are in EVs, of course. After many, many years of driving many, many different EVs, Dave of Norwalk, Connecticut has put himself and his lovely wife, Kathy, on YouTube many, many times over. What's interesting for me as a nerd is also his son, Kyle Connor. I know at the lunch line I heard many people talking about his videos, also super popular. They're not just videos about EVs and the fun of ownership, they're about holding feet to the fire to the industry to try to move it forward. For example, Kyle is there in Germany, hobnobbing with uh, VW and Porsche right now, or yesterday, I guess, listening to that podcast while they're driving down here, how he's trying to encourage them to the standardize and connector, just like the rest of North America is for Ford and GM. It's just a great honor. They, we happen to have someone living right in Norwalk who's driven so many different model EVs, Taycan, Plaid, of course, Model 3, standard range, the base model level, th Model 3, just run the gamut. And the wisdom and experience he has across the board you couldn't ask for a better speaker to try to attract people to a first annual event like this. So, without further ado, we're running a little behind the schedule. Dave's going to come on up. He's already got a microphone, and we're ready to roll. I'm going to turn this on. All right, well, thank you, everyone. Uh, it's great to be here. Really an honor. You know, um, two weeks ago, my son Kyle called me up and said, hey, Dad, I'm going to be going over to Europe. Would you like to come with me? And I said, oh, I can't. i got to speak at a conference in New Haven, Connecticut, <laughs> instead of going to Munich, Germany, and the Swiss Alps. So I, I, when I tell you, I really am super excited to be here today and very honored to be asked. Look, this is, this is not what I do for a living. I'm a Wall Street guy. I've worked at big banks my whole life electronic trading of stocks and futures, algorithmic trading, intangibles. And, uh, but I like to play on the weekends. And, and for me, I've always been a car guy ever since I was, even before 16, my first car was a Mustang, 1966 Mustang. And uh, I think it had more rust on it than I knew what to do with. But um, you know, it's, it's really, to me, a, a great opportunity for us, Kyle, about six years ago, he had this idea while he was selling cars at Tesla that he wanted to make educational videos. And so he just started doing it. And it really is a grassroots thing that's happened. And, and for me, uh, I, I, I remember this one time when I came out to my, my, I had an Ionic 5 and it was in my driveway and the 12 volt battery died on the car and I couldn't get into the car. I couldn't start. Meanwhile, it has this huge, you know, 77 kilowatt hour battery and the car was dead. And, and I thought that was hysterical, right? How is that possible? And, and I made a video about it and we put it up on the Out of Spec Reviews channel and it went to like 300,000 views. So Kyle came to me and he said, hey dad, would you like to maybe start your own channel? And so a year ago, July, I did and I've put up over 170 videos since and I, I shoot them on the weekends, I edit them at night I work in downtown Stanford and live in, in Norwalk, and, and it's just really a, a passion for me that, um, that I've been having a lot of fun. So Bruce, Paul, thank you very much for having me come. It really, truly is an honor, and uh, I'm, I'm super happy to be here today. Out of Spec Studios is uh, based out of Fort Collins, Colorado. Kyle grew up here in New Canaan, uh, went to New Canaan High, and he left. He's like, I'm out of here. He went to the mountains, and I can't say I, I don't blame him. It's beautiful out there in the West, and they have some amazing driving roads, which are incredible. Um, the, the job of Out of Spec, what it has turned into is, we, we're not out here to promote electric vehicles. That's not, that's not what we're here to do. Um, we're here to review cars and review charging and be very critical about what we see and what we like and what we don't like in the industry. Um, it's really about education and informing people. And, I try to do these videos a little different from Kyle. If you ask Kyle how fast does a car charge, he's going to tell you, you know, the kilowatts and the volts and the amps and, uh, and re very technical. And I can go there a little bit, but my wife Kathy, who's here with me today, aka out of spec mom, you know, we go in the car, if somebody asks us how far that fast the car charges, we go, well, it charges really fast, you know, and, and we try to keep it a little bit more real. Uh, the challenge today in putting this presentation together was to figure out 
what level of depth do I go? So hopefully for those of you who are really into EVs, you'll find that a lot of what I say hopefully is confirmation of what you already know. And if it's not, challenge me. Um, and for those of you who are just thinking about getting into EVs or just perhaps bought an EV, right? Roberto, we, we talked about that earlier. Um, maybe this will help you learn a little bit about things. Um, we, we as a firm out of spec studios, we do not take any money from manufacturers. So therefore we're, we, we say what we want and if it's good, it's good. If it's not, it's not. And so that's really what we're, we're committed to doing. We're really trying to be very much unconflicted. This is a picture of Kyle here. This is my family, Kathy, my daughter, Katie. She lives down in Tampa, Florida. She made her first video for the channel when she was on vacation. Um, that actually happens to be the Model 3 refresh that he just ran into in Munich. He didn't even know it was going to be there. And he did a review of that car. And um, we're, we're big fans of Tesla just because of, I think, what they've done for the industry and moving the industry forward. Um, but we're also big fans of, of any of the cars that are out there. But this one in particular, uh, he, was, he was pretty psyched about this car. And I drive a Model 3 rear wheel drive LFP pack, which is the base Model 3. And it's an amazingly good car. And, and with the tax credits that you get here in the state of Connecticut, $2,250 cheaper, depending on your income level, you get a federal, federal tax uh, credit of uh, $7,500. Uh, this year, you'll have to file your taxes to get that rebate or that, that credit back. Next year, you're going to be able to take it right off the hood, so you won't have to finance the $7,500 up front. Great cars, uh, really like them. There's, there's some income limitations about that. So ta talk to your tax, uh, tax advisors. We have a number of channels, and oftentimes people say, you got way too many channels, we can't keep track of it. But the spirit of Out of Spec started with uh, Out of Spec Motoring, which was trying to show people how they can road trip uh, using EVs. And, and then it grew into the Out of Spec Reviews channel. And then we have the podcast channel as well. And then we have the Out of Spec Guide channel. Um, some of you may have watched Kyle and the uh, Inside EVs podcast that goes up Friday mornings every, every Friday at 9.30. Well, Kyle and, and Dom and Tom Malagny, who lives over here in New Jersey, um, they just broke away from Inside EVs and started their new Batteries Included podcast. It's the same cast of characters, the same banter, and a lot of fun, so you can check that out as well. Um, my channel, I've got a little over 14,000 subscribers in a year and about 170 videos up there. And my wife Kathy and I, we have a lot of fun banter going back and forth, and uh, it, it, it's, it's a real good time. So the other thing what's interesting is, last, over Christmas break, Kyle was visiting us down, we have a place down on Marco Island in Florida, and Kyle was visiting us, and we had tried to set up auto charge using EVgo on, on a Tesla, using a Combo One adapter. And it sounds like you should just be able to plug into the EVgo system and have it work. And we had Brandon Flash and Kyle with me, and it took us like two hours to get this thing to work. And, and it's like, I know what I'm doing pretty well. Those guys were stumped, and we, we just, it was crazy. So anyway, he flew home, and when he landed, he decided that he's going to start this thing called Rate Your Charge. And the reason for that was because, I don't know if any of you use PlugShare. Uh, but PlugShare is an application that allows you to find chargers that are out there, and it rates the chargers that are out there. And, and oftentimes it's accurate, and oftentimes it's not accurate. If you charge, if you get a charge, PlugShare may consider that to be a good charging session. So you, you'll get a 10 out of 10 on that. But if it's a 350 kilowatt, meaning it's, it's able to put out a lot of energy, and it's nerfed at only being able to put out one seventh of that, let's say 50 kilowatts, is that a good charge? And so we launched this Rate Your Charge just using Twitter, literally overnight. And I will tell you that in the month of August, we had over 1,200 submissions. We asked people every single time they charge, if you're a Twitter, or now it's called X, right? It, you know, just log it and tell us what's going on. We have a, um, a gentleman on our staff, Ryan, who, who aggregates all the data and puts out a, re a, a, a weekly report, but a monthly summary of what is going on out there. And every single week, Tesla wins by far. They beat every, every, every one of the other uh, networks that are out there. Electrify America, every single week, comes in last place. 
okay? So the, for those of you who have CCS cars, you know what I'm talking about. And we're gonna get into that a little bit here. But I encourage you to embrace Rate Your Charge. We're probably gonna develop this into more of an app as we go on. But the idea is, if you think about it, if you're um, a manufacturer and you provide free, let's say, charging at Electrify America for three years, and to all of, the client, all of your customers who buy a car. If, if, if all of a sudden you're getting a bill at the end of the month for all the people that charged, and Electrify America is telling you that, that it was good service, the question is, was it good? Was it good, fair, or poor service? And so we believe that there is an opportunity to increase the quality of the data that's out there, and that's the spirit of what rate your charge is. Now, let's, let's start getting into um, the different types of vehicles that are out there. There are pure electric vehicles, they call them BEVs, right? Battery electric vehicles. There are, there are um, plug-in hybrid vehicles, and then there are hybrid vehicles. What, what I'm gonna be talking about for the most part today are really just pure EVs. And, and I'm gonna share some of my experiences road tripping them. What I don't wanna do is scare anyone today who's thinking about buying an EV. But I am gonna not sugarcoat it and tell you that it's not all roses out there right now with respect to road tripping. If you are able to charge your car at home, and let's say you have a 50 mile commute, even one way 50 mile commute, and you're able to charge your car at home every day just like you can charge your cell phone every day, you can buy any car, they're all good. From the Kia Nero's and the Kona's all the way up to the most expensive cars. Um, it's when you start taking that car off of the tether of your, of your charging home where things get, get a little bit interesting. So, uh, and that's what I kind of want to spend some time on today. Some of this, this is a slide that I mashed up last night. It seems like a crazy slide, but I want to break this down. There are, you'll hear about level one charging, level two charging, and DC fast charging. Level one charging is, uh, is basically a wall outlet, 120 volt AC. To put it into perspective, you can plug any electric vehicle into a wall outlet and you're gonna get around three miles every hour of charging. And for some people, that's okay, that works. Um, and the connector that that uses is what's called a J1772. I don't know who came up with that name, but I'm sure someone thought about it, but that's kind of a weird name for a connector, but that's what it is. It is AC power that comes out of your house, but batteries store energy in DC. So when you plug an AC charger into your car, your battery has to then convert that energy from AC to DC. And it does the same thing for a level two. You know, you, like at home, you have a dryer vent. They, it, it's this, this um, it looks like a, it, it's got four prongs on it. It's a big 220 or 240 volt. That will give you, if you plug your car into a, a level two, that will give you anywhere between 30 and 40 miles of range every single hour. So if you're driving 200 miles, you come home at six, seven o'clock at night, you plug your car into a level two charger that you install in your garage, and you don't have to buy one of those, uh, one of those charging stations. You can literally just buy, have an electrician install a NEMA 1450 outlet into your, into your garage or wherever you are, and, and, and you plug your car into that, and you wake up the next morning, and you got a full tank of gas. Gas, right, you know what I mean, right? You have all, your full tank of energy. And so you never have to go to the gas station. In fact, I call gas stations air stations. Uh, you know, beef jerky or uh, Slim Jim stations. That's where I get my Diet Coke and my Slim Jims. So now, level one and level two, you got AC that has to be converted over to DC. Now, uh, Bruce was just talking about having the, the Tesla superchargers out there. You'll see the stations, the dispensers, and then behind those dispensers, you'll see these giant white boxes. And what those are is they're converting the energy from AC to DC. So when you plug your car into a DC fast charger, some people call it level three. I don't get really all that annoyed. It's the DC fast charging. You're, you're actually putting DC energy directly into your car. And, and it comes out, like think of a garden hose. Level one, 
the garden hose is just dripping water out very slowly. Level two, it's coming out a lot faster. Level three, or DC fast charging, it's ripping out that, that hose super fast, okay? And it's also bypassing the onboard charger in the car, and it's directly putting DC energy right into the battery pack. Now, when I was a kid, there were two standards for watching movies. There was VHS, and there was Betamax, right? Who here, who here used Betamax? I was a VHS guy. But today, there are two standards when it comes to electric vehicle charging. There's Tesla, which is arguably, remember when Michael Jordan played basketball and he was just better than everybody else? Tesla is the gold standard when it comes to networks. Every single time, for the most part, you plug in, it works. There's a handshake. It's, uh, when you plug in, it's about six seconds before the car starts charging. And I've tested it a lot. Um, on the other side of Tesla's network or standard that they call the North America Charging Standard, which they just literally renamed the Tesla standard, I think it was earlier this year, um, NAX as we call it, there's CCS, which is the Charging Combo Standard. And, and pretty much all other cars use the CCS charging standard. And when you, when you, actually I'm gonna skip over, I'm gonna to go to this slide right here. When you look at the size of the CCS, um, the, the device that you plug into your car, it's, it's like big and heavy and when, it, and when it's cold out and the cables get, they get whatever, you know, brittle or firm or, they're hard to plug into the car. And I, I remember Kathy and I were out on Long Island once, it was cold, and there's a, there was a place where there was a CCS and there was a Tesla, and we, I don't remember what car we were in. And, um, and I was like, oh, it was Kathy, she had a Genesis GV60, and she was trying to plug her CCS, I said, you plug it in, all right. So she's trying to plug it in. Meanwhile, this young lady drives up in her Model 3, gets out, she's talking on the cell phone, one hand takes the Tesla thing, plugs it in, goes back and sits inside, and me and Kathy's like yelling at me, right? So it's, it's, just, it's just a, a bigger, cumbersome standard that, that's a little bit tricky to maneuver. Um, and when you think about this slide that I put together, I tried to kind of emphasize that there's a fragmentation that's happening with respect to CCS charging today. There are manufacturers of charging equipment themselves, firms you may have heard of like ABB, Signet, BTC, and then there are charge point operators who buy the hardware from those manufacturers of the, uh, of the charging equipment. The, the big one is Electrify America. But every one of these pictures represents a different CPO or charge point operator. There's EVgo, there's Volta, there's Blink, there's charge point, there's Flow, there's all these different. And every single one of them has a different app that you have to use. So if you're, if you're driving a CCS car, you go out, you, you, you spend your money, you get the Mercedes EQS SUV, or you get a Kona, or you get a, it doesn't matter, VW ID4, you're gonna be locked into charging on the CCS network at one of these chargers. And, and, and it's just a little bit confusing sometimes, and it takes time to get these, these chargers to activate. Um, so there's, there's, there's a lot of, let's say convergence in the industry that's going on right now, where Jim Farley about three months ago announced, you know what, if, if you can't beat them, join them, right? So he threw in the towel, if you will, as the first major manufacturer to say, in 2024, we're gonna come out for our Mach-E's and our F-150 Lightnings, we're gonna come out with an adapter that will allow you to charge your Ford product using a Tesla supercharger. And there's a lot of fun we can have talking about Tesla fanboys that are going to be upset that now all of a sudden, wait, I bought the Tesla car because I wanted the exclusive use of the Tesla supercharger network. There's so much going on in this debate that's happening right now. Um, but since Ford announced that they're going to support NAX or the North America charging standard, then Mary Barra came out right from GM and then Volvo and Polestar, Honda just this week announced it. Um, and so we have this, what I believe is a good thing happening of the convergence of all these different networks that are out there, uh, all these different manufacturers of the cars 
to be able to say that they're going to allow you as a customer, as a buyer of their, of their car, to be able to rely on the supercharger network. Now, personally, I think rate your charge is gonna get even more interesting because if you think about Tesla, Tesla, what they do is they, they manufacture the cars, they write the software, they build all the superchargers up in Buffalo, they control everything vertically integrated. But when you think about Electrify America, with all due respect, we all know how they were formed, or maybe if you don't, it was a lawsuit around Dieselgate, and, and they were mandated to put a, an electric vehicle charging network in the ground. Now, some may say that they weren't mandated to support it or maintain it, but I won't go there. But if you think about the business problem that they have, is they're buying hardware devices from multiple suppliers of the, the uh, dispensers themselves, and then they have to support multiple manufacturers of the cars. And even though Charn's standards body for CCS sets all these standards, it's a one-to-many, it's actually a many-to-many -many problem that is, is a challenge. And Tesla, by opening up their network, Nax to any of these other manufacturers, I think it's going to get super interesting here. Um, so we'll see what happens with that. So I'm going to jump back two slides to this slide right here. And what I want to do is I want to talk to those people that are thinking about, wait a minute, Dave, you just scared the heck out of me here, right? You know, why would I want to go through all this hassle of buying an EV? If, if, if I have to think about all these things, because today I just pull up to a gas station in three minutes, I get an extra 350 or 400 miles of range. So there are lots of different use cases here. And what I would say is that if you're a two car family and you wanna be super conservative about stepping your foot into perhaps buying an EV, um, you can buy one of your cars as an, an electric vehicle put in charging at home and just daily drive that. And you don't even ever have to take it on a trip or, or you know, a highway road trip. And, and I talk to a lot of people, that's kind of the way they, they get into maybe trying out an EV. Um, there are all these different types of, of use cases, if you will, or how you're planning on using a, uh, a, an electric vehicle. But if someone comes to me and says, Dave, I only have, I only have one car, and even though I don't road trip a lot, um, I don't want to have to have the anxiety of worrying about where I'm going to find a charger or when I find a charger, is it going to be derated, am I going to get the speed, which app am I, all of that. What I tell people, just buy a Tesla. Because it's so super easy. And I don't work for Tesla, I don't get paid by Tesla, I'm just saying it works every single time, it's so easy. But if you want to be adventurous, Go look at the CCS cars as well. I think in two or three years, it's really, this is gonna be a non-issue. We'll laugh at this presentation today. But we're working through all of this convergence of the technologies that are out there. All right, in addition to manufacturers joining NAX, this announcement came out at the end of July that there are a number of manufacturers of cars that are forming their own consortium to build a network. Great, well, good luck. How's that gonna help me today, right? I mean, go for it, but that's not anything that's gonna be popping up out of the ground in the next six months if I'm thinking about buying a car today. It's good that they're doing this, um, and, uh, and, and I, I, I applaud them, but anyway, that's, that's something that I think is, is kind of an interesting, uh, watch this space on charging, but don't, don't get afraid about perhaps trying out an EV just because of everything I said about the charging mess. Let's get into road tripping. If you're, again, just to reiterate, if you're, if you're buying an EV and you're gonna daily drive it and charge it every night at your home, just like your cell phone, any of the cars are great. They really are, they're amazing. They drive great. Um, regen, all the different things that, if you haven't driven one yet, please go drive one. But if you're taking a road trip, it's funny, Kyle and I, we were on a road trip ourselves once, and we said, what are the three things that we think are super important that every car should have when you're road tripping? And these are the things. An integrated route planning sort of software navigation, way to figure out not only where you're going, but along the way, what chargers are there? And am I gonna make it there? 
When I arrive, what state of charge am I going to arrive at? So route planning is key. Battery preconditioning is the second point. What, what happens with these giant batteries that are in these cars is that if they're either too hot or too cold, they don't take on the perfect amount of energy. They will, the car, one of the things that a lot of people don't realize is that the car itself tells the charger how much energy it, it wants. It's, it's not the other way around. So if you pull up to a 350 kilowatt Electrify America charger and you're driving a Bolt, and I run into this a lot where I see Bolt owners charging on 350s. Meanwhile, I pull up with a Lucid that can charge at 320 max peak before it tapers. And they're like, well, my salesman told me that I should go to the fastest charging. I'm like, sir, listen, that's, I, I get that. That makes logical sense. But your car is only capable of telling the unit to give me 55 kilowatts. So why don't you move over to the 150, if you don't mind, and they do it in a nice way. That's the one thing that we, we all want to try and help each other out. Nobody, I don't, I don't believe anybody is malicious or nasty, although I did run into one guy, which I'm going to talk about in Greenfield, Mass., this weekend, but uh, but the thing is that that um, you know this this whole idea about battery preconditioning is that you want your battery to be at the optimal temperature to be able to receive the maximum amount of speed that the car requests from the charger, and um, and so this is something that is 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 really important to have on, on a car. And the last thing is plug and charge. What does that mean? That means that you take the plug, you plug it into your car, and it charges. No apps, no fooling around, just, just plug it in and charge. You know, you know which company does all these three? Tesla. Every single one of these things, not only do they do it, they do it really well. And I'm not, I'm not up here advocating Tesla, what I'm saying is that Every other manufacturer should see that vision as far as how easy it is to road trip a Tesla and, and deliver integrated route planning, battery preconditioning, and plug and charge. Those are the three things that I think are super important. Bruce, how am I doing on time? Three minutes. There's no way. All right, so let me, let me click, we'll click through this fast. Route planning, there are a lot of different software applications if, you, if you're not using a Tesla. There's PlugShare, there's a better route planner, Electrify America itself, Apple Maps, Google Maps has built all of their maps into Volvos and Polestars. And, and the industry is getting there. They're, they're getting better. But there's glimpses of opportunity to make it even better. The second, battery preconditioning. If, if, I'm not going to go over this too much, but basically, most of the cars today will have battery preconditioning. Most of them you'll have to put in your destination and then the car will determine how far it is away, what the temperature is now, and whether or not it needs to either heat up or cool down the battery. So when you arrive, you'll be pulling the optimal amount of energy. And then finally, plug and charge, which is, as I mentioned before, the ability to just plug in your car and to have it and have it charged without having to use an app. All right, I made it to my last screen, but I could spend five hours on this screen. <laughs> I'm going to go through this a little bit quickly. I'm going to start with etiquette. I'm going to start with etiquette. Um, the other day I was driving home in what car? My Lucid from Vermont. I was in Greenfield, Mass, and I saw a bolt at a traffic circle, and I beat him in and he was behind me. And it was one of those things that was at um, like a community college. I'd never been to this CCS station. It was a charge point. It was the only DC fast charger in the entire area. And by the way, it was 50 kilowatts, okay? So is that, it's DC, is that fast? So anyway, but it was, it was better than having a level two. So I took a left, he took a right, he beat me to the, to, the, to the DC fast charger fair and square. And I rolled down my window when I pulled up and I said, hey, listen, how long are you planning on charging? And I'm looking at the Bolt. And I, look, I like Bolts. I used to have one. They're great cars. He said, until full. So I said, listen, would you mind if I just charge for five minutes? I think I can, yeah, you know, 
we have this style at out of spec for those of you who watch our videos what we tend to go down super low state of charge but I, all I wanted to make sure was I could get to the Chicopee EA. I wasn't sure if it was a signet or not, if I was going to get the signet surge because I got a high voltage battery pack and the Lucid. So for those of you who know what I'm talking about, it's, it's kind of crazy. And the guy reluctantly said yes to me, go ahead and charge. So I plugged in and then I went over to his window to thank him. And he got really angry at me. I hope he's not here. Well, if he is, <laughs> if he is, I'm six foot five. So. But, you know, and then he, he um, said some choice words. He said that I was entitled and that he beat me there. And I said, so the message here, folks, is just be sort of calm and cool when it comes to charging and help people. You, you know when you're charging if someone wants to talk to you or not. If they don't want to talk to you, don't talk to them. You know, it doesn't matter. It's, for a lot of people who just want to get their juice and leave. But etiquette, I think it's going to get very interesting and ugly out there, especially as Nax, you know, superchargers open up to non, non Tesla cars. Um, and I just ask for everyone to be nice to people. Range anxiety, and I promise I'll finish up quickly. I don't think the issue today is range anxiety. I think it's charger anxiety, right? I think we're gonna see smaller battery packs with a lot more infrastructure in the ground. Bruce, what you have here, 10 miles up the road, 20 miles up the road, there's gonna be charging stations, just like you don't worry about where am I gonna get my next, next gas from? Where am I gonna get that? Unless you're going super high into the mountains. I can tell you that I was in Stratton, Vermont over the weekend. I went down to Wilmington to charge at a, uh, it was in a, what was it? I can't remember exactly what charging station it was, and it did not work. So then I went down, to Bennington to a flow and I was able to plug in and but that was the only DC fast charger from basically Killington South in the entire state of Vermont and it was the only one and the one in Wilmington wasn't working and I don't believe there was one in Brattleboro um, so that's why I went down to Greenfield so the fear of not being able to charge your car is anxiety but the cars themselves have plenty of range. 250 miles of range is enough for you to say on a road trip, it's time to stop, I wanna get a bite to eat, I wanna walk my dog, whatever it is. But it's not enough if you're worrying about whether or not there's going to be charging when you get there. And when you get there, is the charging going to work and is it going to work at a fast enough speed for you to be able to get on your way? So I think the, the terminology is now um, charging anxiety and as a matter of fact, um, Jim Farley just took an F-150 Lightning around um, out on the, on the West Coast, and he even said charging anxiety is, is really what it's about. Um, true road trip horror stories. I'll just tell you one quick little story. I drove the Lucid from, from Fort Collins. My son borrowed it for five months or so, and we tried to set the Cannonball run record with it, and it should have beat, for those of you who know the Cannonball, um, the EV Cannonball is, is a record that Kyle, he broke it with his Model 3 rear wheel drive, then Porsche slipped him a car, he broke it with a 4S Taycan, then, um, then Ryan from the Kilowatts took the Model S and beat Kyle's record in the Porsche, and I was like, Kyle, we should buy a Lucid and get that, you know, get that, that title back. And we thought, so we did, and we bought my car, and he chipped in a little bit, not as much as I would have liked, but he chipped in. And, um, and then he set off, after I drove the car from Florida up to New Jersey, he left uh, the, the Red Ball garage in New York and went out to Redondo Beach, and he was off the record by over three hours. Not because of the car. Lucid makes, it's out here, you guys can see it after, I'm happy to show it to anyone. 516 miles of EP rated range, the fastest charging car pretty much you can buy. It was all about the network. It was all about every time you, you, you plug in, D-rated. And, and part of this is because Electrify America was very early on in putting their chargers into the ground, buying chargers from Signet. And the, the Lucid is a very newer technology, higher voltage car. And the car is asking for a lot of energy. And then the Signet older station that was built back in 2018, it can't deliver it. So what it does is it gives a lot of energy then it says, wait, I'm overheating. Then it gives a little energy. And then it gives a lot, and then a little. And it ping-pongs back and forth. It's something that we've actually dubbed the signet surge. 
and, and, and it's a problem. Now, I think that Kyle was just out with Lucid um, talking with the engineers two and a half weeks ago in uh, Newark, California, and our videos actually empowered Lucid to be able to go back to EA, uh, not just our videos, but the message was you need to get these, these Signet uh, chargers working better. And so we're hearing, I'm gonna test it, we're hearing that they are, uh, they are supposedly gonna be getting this, um, this, this away. But the, the story as I was driving back from Fort Collins, I stopped in, um, uh, in, in uh, South Bend, Indiana, and there was four EA stations there. There was a bolt plugged into a 350 classic that was at 100% state of charge and had been on the hook for an hour and 15 minutes after hitting 100% state of charge. Why did I know that? Because you could read it on the screen. Next to it was the other 350, down, didn't work. And then you had two Mustang Mach-E's there that were both charging to 100%. When I talked to them, they were local. I'm passing through. So that kind of goes back to the etiquette part of things. And um, you know, I consider that a horror story. The last horror story that I'll share with you is I was driving up from Orlando in the Lucid and I stopped at a EA and there was a line of seven cars and they were all Polestar 2s. Well, six out of seven were Polestar 2s. I was like, that's weird, how could that be? You know what they were? They were all from the local Hertz rental car company that drove their cars over to charge at EA as I'm driving through. So etiquette goes beyond just people, it goes to corporations as well. Look, in life what I've learned is do the right thing and good things will happen. If you don't know what the right thing is, then you can't be blamed. And that's why I think it's important for us to educate people. If, if they, they don't realize what they're doing from a standpoint of DC fast charging, they're staying on the hook too long, help them out if they're willing to listen. And, and that's really um, what, what I think uh, we're all trying to do. The power of YouTube is, is an amazing thing. Um, there's my wife Kathy and I down on the beach on Marco, our happy place. And uh, you can follow us on Twitter, X, whatever it is, out of spec mom, out of spec Dave. You can, you can um, reach out to me via email if you ever have any questions. But what we are trying to do with our platform, and especially Kyle with the, the broad reach that he has, is really just educate. And look, I hope today this was something that you can um, you know, take maybe get some value out of. I'm happy to share this presentation with any of you and um, reach out to me, I'm here. Any questions or, or answers in respect of time, you know, you can catch me afterwards, but if anybody has any questions, I'm happy to, to, to take them now um, or we can, we can move on. Yeah. Okay, so the question was, how, how do I feel about Tesla gaining so much power over the standard? And, and here, here's what it comes down to. Tesla has earned the right out of ingenuity, forethought, to be in the position that they're at today. Okay, the fact that they could perhaps broker and almost create monopolistic business, um, you know, marking up energy more than perhaps they should, is something I've thought about as I fall asleep at night. I remember when AT&T got broken up, right? The BLCs, that's how Verizon and Bell Atlantic and all that happened. Um, you know, could that happen with Tesla? Maybe, but I don't think Tesla has, this is my own opinion. For those of you that maybe think Elon's crazy, and maybe he is, the guy's changing the world and he really truly does have the right, in my opinion, spirit in mind to make this world a better place, a greener place. And he is indifferent how it happens. I've even heard him say, maybe some of you as well, you like the GM, buy the GM, whatever. You don't want the Cybertruck, go get the Silverado, go for it. And so um, I, I have concerns, but I think that the pace with which cars are selling right now 
It's needed. That th th this is this is a problem right now. I mean, look how many you have how many twelve superchargers out there? Are, how often are they full? Uh, hi, uh, they're almost full at least four times a week. Four times a week. That's nothing, right? I, I actually think I, I think a hotel is actually the wrong place for DC fast charging because I think that if I pull in here and I'm sleepy and it's midnight and I put my car on the hook and all of a sudden there's there's a whole bunch of, like now I have to wake up at, at you know 45 minutes later and go unplug my car and move it I like the level twos and I'm not criticizing DC fast charging here but the slower charging is actually better for some applications malls is an example and, and I think we need a lot more level twos out there than DC fast chargers at certain types of places but we're happy you have it here Right, people that are driving through and they see it on their maps, yeah. Does that answer your question? And we could talk more about that. Any other questions? What do you see as the kinetic of going into the of the car? Okay, so the question is, when do I see Connecticut um, giving the allowance to sell cars in Connecticut? I, 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 I look. We have a state representative. We do, yeah? Uh, I mean, I think that it, it's a very interesting thing. I, I don't, I heard that you can, perhaps, on, at Mohegan Sun, am I right, wrong? Yes. Yes. Okay, so, so it's a super hot topic. Look, I, I do very much appreciate the dealer networks, and I appreciate what dealers do, but I'm also a big fan of business um, ingenuity, and when someone comes up with a better idea to serve people in the, in the economy, I don't believe politics should get in the way of that. So me, I'm against it. But, but having said that, I also understand the dealer network of buying cars from manufacturers, being the broker to sell them. I'm, I'm in the brokerage business, I get it. As long as you're adding value. So, I don't know what the solution is, but I personally don't think that any government should tell a company that you can't do something, especially if it's helping, in my opinion, helping out the overall goal of making this a greener planet. So uh, that's just me. Any other questions? Okay, well thank you very much everyone. Thank you. Thank you.